o'clock on the dot, start on time, and maybe end a little bit earlier. On behalf of the Board of Directors, we'd really like to thank you for coming once again to the CFAC Committee, Citizens Facility Advisory Committee. Uh, we've been up to a lot of work since this last came together in October. And uh, what I want to do is introduce a couple of folks to you and just kind of frame what tonight would look like. Here with NAC Architecture, we have Brian Love and Alliance Construction Management, Liz Leroy. And since the last time we met, the district put out an RFQ, Request for Qualifications, around the area of owner's rep services and architectural services. And what we were really hoping to do is develop in a transparent way that long-term partnership to help us envision and take the ideas that the CFAC committee had and put that into practice and traction and help pave a way forward thinking about how do we tackle growth. Liz, as an owner's rep, is the representative to the district. So the board of directors charges her with keeping tasks like moving forward and deform processes and working us all the way through to completion. The architect's job as a contractor is to help gather ideas and input publicly, get those ideas, put those into designs, and work us up not only to the bid process, but beyond to manage the project. So those two together with our staff are helping to pull us together and move forward. And I'm going to turn it over here in just a little bit to Mr. Bryan. Before I do, just a couple key charges are remembering about kind of the committee's role and the committee's work. So what we want to do is just as a committee make sure that we're keeping our constituency involved along the way and gathering voice to help inform the board of directors in terms of the ideas of how we might tackle things and move forward as a system. We're going to look at some of the feedback opportunities tonight so you have a chance to give us a little bit of input from a committee perspective. We do have a meeting next Thursday with the board of directors where we're going to be discussing growth and forward movement so your ideas helps to shape their ideas, their planning, and their feedback so that we can give that to the board of directors. We're going to do a little bit of recap of where we've been as well as kind of set some of the forward movement and discuss next steps. Thinking about the roles of the CFAC, we just hope that you can share your truth. We know that really the idea of building and growth and construction represents community because these aren't school-owned facilities. They're public-owned facilities. And so we're just the stewards or the custodians. So we want to make sure that we're capturing the input from those stakeholders as we're thinking about where we're going and how we move forward. We want to get feedback on that long-range plan. None of us knows for sure what assessed valuation will do, when enrollment will hit. So we want to make sure that we're continuing that long-term planning so that Warding School District is set up for the future and we don't have a potential misstep. We want to get feedback. Uh, we anticipate in the fall around boundaries. Right now, we do not have clearly established boundaries amongst the two elementary schools. We know that at some point in the next four years, as we open a new boarding elementary, we'll have two K-5s, and somewhere not too long after that, we'll shift to three, and probably not too long after that is constructed, we've been considering a fourth. We want to be mindful, if you think about that kindergarten student, they're in that school for six years, and so we want to avoid a scenario where we're hopping and moving and un creating unnecessary transitions for kids, and we know before we run a bond, our stakeholders will want to have some sense of what is this going to look like for our family and our children. And we aim to do that. So we hired a demographer, Davis Demographics, and we're going to start that process of helping us to look at the long-term enrollment. And with new computer modeling, they can break that down by neighborhood and help us to see where things are coming. And at this process of future CFAC in the fall, we'll start to get some input on what boundaries would look like with that idea that if I come in as a kindergartner, I'll be able to stay through and make that move to middle so we can see what that impact would be. So we do think that's future work. We won't be ready for that uh, before summer, but after summer. And we'll get some additional feedback on high school phasing. The CFAC committee uh, did have some recommendations about a potential start at the high school. And so there's some different scenarios that we could run based on the anticipated price point, and you'll get some of that feedback uh, today, the opportunity to give that. So uh, really looking at other options, a new elementary school design, the committee was very adamant that we need to replace Ording Elementary, or Ording Primary now, a future Ording Elementary. So we'll share some updates on what does that look like and anticipated cost of what that project would look like, as well as how are we gonna get voice? What does that look like from our constituents, staff, students, families, things like that. Um, other than that, I think we're ready to kick it off and get into the work. So Mr. Brian Love, again with NAC Architecture, he's going to take it from here. Thank you very much, Ed. And 
I'm just so surprised that you let me talk about this slide because it's the great news that the school district has purchased this property for the expansion of future facilities. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I think it's right there. And I, I gotta tell you, it was raining before as I was driving into Ording. As soon as I saw that City of Ording sign, the clouds broke. <laughs> I imagine the future bridge and imagine going through that portal and seeing these new properties there. It's gonna be great. So right now, you'll hear me say for the first time of many times in this presentation, the phrase, a deeper dive. So before the property was purchased, we did a deeper dive into what would be developable on the property. Now this property is on the river, and so not surprisingly, there are portions of this property that are within the 100-year floodplain. So it's this low-lying area that you see that's just off of the area in the dark blue, and because of the way the, the grade, the topography, the slope of that property is situated, the 500-year floodplain is really not much further outside the 100-year. There's kind of this higher area up at the top that is outside of the floodplain. Um, portions of that upper area do have wetlands in them. And so if you were to look at those two parcels separately, we have parcel A, that's 9.9 .9 acres of developable property outside of those wetlands. And then on parcel B, at first glance, it would look like there's only 1.43 acres outside of the wetlands. I should say, before we, before we think too hard about that number, there are things that we can do to make that much more developable. But before we talk about that parcel B, let's focus on parcel A because it is the perfect size and the perfect location for a future elementary school. And I should say what you're seeing uh, on that parcel A, uh, that, is, that is not the new design of the elementary school. We are not that fast. I am not that good. I will lower the expectations now. But that is a test fit of what could be on the property because we want to make sure that it's the right size, the right shape, has the right access to be able to put all the things that you need on it to be a great uh, future elementary school for Ording. And so that's including areas for parking, for, the, for parents, for a bus drop-off, fields, of course the school. And you'll notice that some of that access um, could come down across the other parcel and connect in to uh, the future roundabout we see at White Hawk. So I'm going to move on to parcel B because there are options for parcel B. One of those options could be that we mitigate the wetlands by filling in some of them that are in this western corner the property, and we can do that because if we fill in part of the wetlands here, we just need to improve wetlands on another part of the site. And there are lots of technicalities and ratios that go into that, but the big picture is that there are ways that we can make part of that developable by improving other areas on the site. Um, we could push one step further as well to make even more of that developable. Um, this would have more 13.2 acres that could be developable. Now, some of the wetlands that would be filled in in this area are some of the guess, more, um, the better wetlands that are on the property. So the mitigation for that larger amount of mitigation, it does begin to, to creep across, as we see. So what do we get with these two kind of developable sites? One option could be, hey, we could put something like a future district office on that property, as well as all of the amenities that would go along with it. Another option, if we had the larger, more extensive property, could be, well, let's put a facility like the district offices, as well as things like fields, as well as things like tennis courts, these amenities that have that community as well as that school use. You might ask a question, well, you're right next to the high school. Why aren't you putting the high school on this other property? And one of those reasons is because if you think about stretching the high school across the rest of Highway 162, your high school campus would be about half the width of Ording. So we want it to stay more condensed, stay more dense, and we think that the better thing to do is to, to um, maybe to take some of the things that are currently on the high school site and think of other areas where those could go so you can have a dedicated high school site. I think that was some of the impetus um, that you had behind um, demolishing boarding primary school in the first place. Um, so I think as we uh, 
if you if you've been driving by and paying attention to some of the things that are are happening on the property, you might notice some trucks, might notice some activity there on this future property. And like, this. Can speak a little bit to that. We have been moving forward because the, as you saw, the wetlands, well conditions, transportation studies are going to be required for the north parcel, uh, and we want to be thorough. And so we've been working hard to progress that first. And so we have consultants that are working on all those components. The city, and we also are going through with the city as a partner for a rezone of that parcel. And so um, that that takes time. And, and as you saw with the diagram, what that would do earlier is that would move the primary elementary school to the new boarding elementary school site, which would free up space for future development for the high school. So we have front um, we have front loaded, I would say, a lot of um, owner consultants to do that work. So you might see trucks, borings, big auger drills, and things like that. So those are what we call, it's, it's beyond due diligence. It's, um, it's a good amount of that work that is needed when we start to develop the plans, information that the architects use for structural engineering and things like that. So we have been moving forward with, with that work. One of the other things that we're doing is we've requested a zoning change with the city because the zoning of that property is one that's really more intended for a commercial development. So it has different requirements and land use regulations that are really specific and only appropriate for commercial development, but we're not, we're not doing that. We're building schools on it, and so we've requested that it, it change, and that's a change that the, that, the, um, uh, that the city government will take up in the future. Um, you might have noticed that, hey, kind of seems like you've gone a little bit further ahead with the elementary school. And one of the reasons for that is because of how long it takes to get through the paperwork associated with developing on properties that has wetlands. I see a slow nod here. This person has experienced it, it seems like. And so um, one of the things is just getting started early with that so that we understand what the impacts are and thinking through the permitting regulations. So when we look at the overall schedule for what it takes to get to completion for an elementary school, you know, we are talking about things like the zone change, uh, mitigating the wetlands, issues of traffic, as well as just the more typical things that we would do, like getting permits from the city and the construction timeline as well. So when we look at that entire arc, that takes about four years. We got started right now. That would mean that the school could open in the fall of 2026. Of course, the property that's been purchased is, is not the only property that's needed in order to um, make good on all of the capacity needs for elementary schools and other facilities across the district. And I know there have been some inroads looking at the properties in, in Tahale and some of the other surrounding developments. So in previous meetings, uh, the CFAC made several recommendations that I kind of want to refresh our memory of right now because then for the rest of the, of the presentation, we're talking about some of the new information that we know as we have made a deeper dive. So some of those recommendations that were made were this idea of replacing the Orting Primary School with a new elementary school to help with elementary capacity. At the, at the high school then, this would be demolishing the wrestling gym and then replacing that with a new gymnasium and also uh, replacing the CTE spaces that are on the property and overall adding 300 um, student capacity level to that school. Additionally, to further help the elementary school capacity, building a new addition at PTR. Um, as we look at phase two, some of those major things that are suggested, that were recommended, were expanding the permanent capacity at Ording High School by 600 students, so an addition there with a lot of classrooms. Um, and then also um, renovating and expanding Ording Middle School to improve the capacity there, as well as looking at some of those future developments at Tahali and Uplands and Sunrise, and having an elementary school located in those developments, um, as well as potential other support facilities. And finally, as, we, as this group looked at phase three, some of the recommendations that were made were expanding the permanent capacity at Ording High, High School by an additional 600 students so that overall, as you looked at adding uh, facilities and removing some of the temporary ones, this would be at a capacity of about 1,500 students, as well as an entirely new middle school in the Tahali area, 
and a new additional elementary school and those developments as well. So I will, I will direct your attention to the bar on the left hand side of what has changed. I'm going to go through this line by line because this is really the essence of some of the new information that we have learned and that we've gathered and then understanding, well, what do we do with this information? How do we make good advice and good recommendations based on this new information? So one of the things that we've heard is that as other school districts surrounding have completed projects, and have brought new work online, their student generation rates, that is the capacity that they need to build, hasn't been as much as they had planned to do. Because of this change in student generation rates, it makes us look more closely at how that might project out for Horton School District as well. Um, something that's even more specifically that we've learned is that at the middle school level, as we've projected out across the future bonds that may be voted in, that it, it, it just won't quite be at the cusp where it seems like a new entire middle school would be warranted. And there's some more specific information that we'll go into on that. Third. So on that second point, what we really don't see is enough capacity in the first couple of phases where a new middle school would be warranted. Somewhere when you get to about the end point of 2032 to 2035 when Sunrise is built out, that's another 1,300 homes, at that point it starts to tip that scale to where maybe the aggregate middle school students will be about 13 to 1,500. At that point, around that phase three time point, we think there's probably a need for a third middle. In the near term, probably phase two, we think there's not a need for a new middle school, but likely additional capacity because Mr. Collins and his team are about 50 kids away from being full from what it was built for. So we do think there's a four to five classroom addition and or temporary capacity needs about phase two. So that'd be the clarification I would add. Thank you, Ed. Additionally, as we look at the elementary school level then, and we look at what needs to be constructed and how the plans for that might change, we might recommend adjusting some of the sizes of those elementary schools to give flexibility for how each of those facilities might be used as the, the enrollment and as the capacity changes across the district. Something that I think many of you are experiencing in your daily lives right now is that costs are increasing for some of this, the underlying inputs for construction, like fuel costs, the costs of commodity materials, and so that's something that we're tracking to understand what can be afforded in each of the bond programs. Um, additionally, one of the things that was recommended is you know, with Hording Primary School, if we can get rid of it, then is there, are we making way for other development? And we might suggest that it's useful to keep OPS, at least for the end of phase one, because that means that you're able to use it to help with capacity at the high school rather than adding more portables, rather than um, it, it gives you future flexibility for the different options you might suggest for what gets constructed on that site. And then the last thing that I'd like to say on this slide is that um, there's something really psychologically powerful for voters when you can say to them, that we made promises, we followed through, and all of the construction that's done within a bond program is completed before the next vote happens. They see all of the projects that are done in that following through. And so at least between phase two and phase three, because there may be some things that are happening on the property, especially ones that either involve complex phasing, maybe at the high school, or ones that are impacting the wetlands that, as we pointed out, have a lot of permitting requirements, be stretching out the distance between those bond programs so that we go to five years instead of four. <clears throat> and so um, I would say that this uh, bond phasing, that adjustment that we were talking about would be one where bond one, 2023, those projects would open 2026. And then in phase two, we would still continue to keep it with that four year uh, gap between phase one and phase two since we've started early on that elementary school, but then between phase two and phase three, there's that separation of suggesting, let's stretch that out by an additional year. So we don't, as Ed had pointed out, we don't know what the assessed value is, properties at that point. We don't necessarily know what the debt capacity will be at that point, but by stretching it out that much more, we do know that that will give extra room to be able to consider what should be constructed. So on this graph, 
what you are seeing is we're seeing the projected enrollment for the elementary schools in the top. Those are the two blue lines. And the reason why there are two lines for the elementary school is the upper line is saying this is, this is if we have a high student generation rate. Again, we're trying to target and track what's happening in other districts around us as they're bringing schools online. How can we make the best decisions about how many students are going to show up when school opens? And so on the top line, we have, well, what if that's a high number? What's the high watermark that we need to build capacity for? And then on the low end, that's the low number. We need something to happen in between those lines. We think that the eventual capacity will be in between those lines. So again, on the upper line, we have the elementary school. On the middle line, or sorry, on the upper line, we have the elementary school. On the middle line, we have the middle school. And then on the lower line, we have the high school. I'm going to return to this, but what we need to layer over it is some of the information about what can be constructed and then how that impacts the capacity of each of those levels. So what I want to show you on the top is this is the capacity of the existing facilities. And these, these might be a little bit lower than you saw in the last CFAC meetings, but these are based on a deeper dive of talking to the administration at each of those buildings and understanding what of their facilities is being used for student capacity. So we take that existing capacity that you see, and then we compare that to those high and low watermarks over time. So those three columns are, this is what happens um, during the 26 to 27 school year when phase one of the uh, bond program would be completed. And then here's what's happened in 2031, 2032. And then finally, at the end of the third phase, over here. So what we're showing is that um, there are these two different options that has been suggested. I think in the last CFAC meeting, there was a suggestion of adding the CDE classrooms as well as the gym, and that would impact uh, at least 300 student capacity, which would improve the overall building capacity to a 1,645 with all of the temporary facilities as well. And I know that's why we're thinking if you keep Orting, where's the uh, Orting Primary School there, then at least for capacity reasons, just for the actual population of the students, you, you wouldn't need to do something in phase one. You would have a lot more flexibility in what you choose to do in, in phase, sorry, you wouldn't have to do anything in phase two. You'd have a lot more flexibility of what you choose to build in phase two. Then as we look at the middle school, and we see that student population, we see what there's capacity for right now. We see that really at the end of the first bond program, we think that even in the low case, there's going to be a greater need for capacity than what's there right now with the existing facility. But it does seem like there's opportunities to be able to use some of the portables that are at PTR currently um, once phase one, once maybe an addition at PTR is complete. So that's close by and able to be used by the middle school. That's an opportunity. Um, to address that capacity reason. But as we look across at the end of phase two, at the end of phase three, we're seeing this, this flatter growth such that it, it just may not make sense to do more than an addition at the middle school, as Ed had suggested. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide because that is what overlays some of this information about the overall uh, growth in student capacity over time with what the capacity is as you complete each of the buildings within that bond program. And so what you're seeing in this gold column here, and then these dots, that is what the capacity is as you complete a facility for that project, for that phase. And so um, my, my shorthand for what you're looking for is you always want to see those dots above the line of the capacity trend that you're following. So if we were to follow the elementary, for example, we have our high mark here, and we have our low mark here, and we wanna see that as elementary schools are coming online here, and here, and then depending on the size of the elementary school here or here, we're never following, falling below that capacity trend line. And certainly that's true for things like if we look at the high school, as capacity, uh, as enrollment increases, see where we are, oh, we're way up here. <laughs> we're well above, we're well above what the capacity need is, and then as that trickles across, 
and those other improvements are made, we're always above that capacity line. So, um, as we look at what might go into each of those bond programs, then what we see is that in phase one, a suggestion could be that a new elementary school, like what we were showing on that parcel A in the initial map, uh, could be one that we construct. And as we looked at some of the costs for that, say that that, that facility, uh, we're estimating around $78 million, so that would open in 2026. We know that there's some work to be done at the high school, and I think that's something that we're going to talk to you and get more information from you about later in this meeting. And then additionally, that um, increase in capacity at PTR, which we have at about 22 million. Um, and as I've said, numbers, it takes us to our next topic, which is that is it, costs have increased. You know, you're seeing this as you go to the gas station, you're seeing this as you get groceries, and certainly construction workers are seeing it when they when they give proposals on costs. So the way that we arrive at these numbers is we're tracking the costs of projects that are currently in construction now in neighboring districts, ones that are currently in design right now. We're asking our estimators that we work with that see these projects every day, what are you seeing as you've gotten numbers from contractors, as you've been able to give estimates on projects that are currently in design? And then we're trying to take those numbers and making them appropriate for your project, for the size of the project, for the site that you're building on. So it's not just generic, it's something really specific to, in this case, what a new elementary school on that specific property might cost. And one of the things I would uh, underscore here is that increased cost of construction per square foot, as that $425 per square foot, and then also we're seeing increased costs for site development, and that's cost per, per acre. Uh, and I think I, you heard me say really on that, that parcel A, that's 9.9, .9, nearly 10 acres. Those underlying increases of cost though, aren't the only thing that we really pay attention to when we're estimating projects. Some of the other things that we look at is just the escalation. Escalation means the rate of inflation that these costs are increasing at. Because if I were to tell you, well, in today's dollars, it costs X, this project isn't going to actually be bid by a contractor until later in 2024. We usually estimate to the midpoint of construction. So that's the midpoint of 2025 to understand what those construction costs would be as the building is being constructed. But of course, every project has some changes, and so there's a, there's a contingency for changes that we add in. There's also sales tax that's added in. And then finally, there are soft costs that we need to consider. And the soft costs are things like what you see on the right-hand side, things like state sales tax, the testing and inspections, even things like furniture that are not a part of the construction contract. All of those need to be considered. We, need, we give you that number of 78 million. Just to briefly point out, when we were together in the Citizens Facility Committee uh, previously, we looked at a, a number for elementary capacity of about 600 students. And that was kind of the target. Really, the feeling of the community was that we want to maintain that personal connection and that relationship. And that was a value leaning in. One of the pieces since then we've looked at is there's no projection to say we would stay at 600. Uh, every conception and modeling we do say that somewhere if we build it at six it's going to get to seven seven fifty eight maybe eight fifty before we open and what the architects pointed out to us you know you're going to spend a million a million and a half in portables before you even get going too far and for four more million we can build it at the right size of what we think we would have so there you see that capacity change from 600 to 700 just from a financial perspective, it's gonna make more sense to build it a little bit bigger because you know the growth will be there. What's unsure is how many years before that third elementary came online. So their feedback to us is we might wanna kick that up a little bit because it's more cheaper to do it on the front end than try to chase that down the road through portables and other temporary facilities. I'd just like to hand it to you. I just went through the densest, most numbers-driven part of the presentation, and I saw alert eyes, I saw nodding. You have done a great job absorbing all of this. Now we're going to get to the fun part. We're beginning to ask for more feedback. We're going to talk about some of the things that might happen at the high school. So at the biggest possible picture, the strategy that seems to make sense to us at the high school is let's keep what is still useful and in good condition 
Let's replace the things that are no longer of service to us. And currently, there are still some portions of the facility that we just don't know. We just don't know uh, whether it's going to be something that we want to renovate or not. And that's the curved building that you see in the top, right? And that's why, as Liz pointed out, we're doing some soil borings to be able to understand, is this a good foundation that it makes sense to invest more money to build on top of? So the current existing high school building, when we look at all of the existing permanent capacity, we see 110,000 square feet. This is for uh, a capacity of 600 permanent. And then in the portables, another 281 students. So um, when we compare that to what the building area really needs to be for a capacity of 16 to 1750 students, we see it, it's fairly numerical. It's a, it's a facility of nearly 260,000 square feet. I think just considering those numbers, this is a lot of growth. It does need to happen over potentially several phases. Um, I'd like to point out though that there, there are other reasons why a facility might be added onto or why specific portions of the facility might be replaced. It's not all just for growth or for capacity. Um, there may be reasons why we either prioritize or why we would replace something because it's just not educationally serving those students anymore. And I think in part that was maybe one of the drivers why the CFAC considered that the CTE could be something that takes higher priority early on because those new spaces can really serve specific programs that are at that school. So um, we have some options that, that we have studied and we can say all of these are possible, but the kind of rule that we followed is we can really only afford so much, we can really only build so much. So for if we allocate say $50 million or 50,000 square feet, it can be constructed these options are on the table. One, the very first one, option A, this is what was the suggestion based on the information that you had at the end of the last CFAC meeting. So this is potentially, let's add 300 student capacity, let's replace classrooms in a CTE, and then also uh, serve the gym facility. So this would be new main gym, wrestling room, and then expanded lockers. Um, option B is 500 student capacity. This would be all academic spaces. This is classrooms and CTE that's replaced. And option C, maybe uh, we need to add something more than classrooms, but instead of the gymnasium, maybe it needs to be something that really expands this kind of space that serves student gathering and student dining. And then finally, a last option is, can we do a little bit of everything? But I'll point out that if we do a little bit of everything, the student capacity is, is not helped as much because some of those things that you're building, like a, like a commons, it doesn't really have teaching stations in it, so it, it doesn't address capacity. And before we're going to we're going to have, we're going to have table talk, and I ask you to consider this amongst yourselves. I want to talk about one other thing, and that's about the, the funding analysis. Um, and so, just a, a brief uh, refresher: we talk about um, a bond. We can really only go up to five percent of the assessed valuation of the district. The assessed valuation changes over time because we're looking at the literally the value of the capital improvements inside of the district as well as how much those are worth, which changes over time. And so when we're talking about the assessed value, as, as you see when you pay taxes, it's that uh, dollars per thousand square foot of assessed value. Um, the, the school board I know was interested in understanding you know, what are the what is the importance of different sizes of that phase one bond, you know, from, from 100 million, 125 to 150 million, and if we recall some of the numbers that we were talking about earlier, if an elementary school was projected to cost about 78 million, and then we didn't talk about it much, but the addition at PTR would be around 22 million, and that's the 100 million right there. So if it was a $100 million bond program, there, there would not be um, value in that to be able to address things at the high school. What we've been talking about up until now when we say that at $50 million, at 50,000 square feet in the previous options, that's really a bond program that's at that $150 million mark. Um, and the increase in property um, in taxes per thousand square feet, uh, thousand dollars of assessed value is 44 cents. Um, so I think the two questions that we'd really like you to consider within this table discussion, if you can push your chairs together in groups, 
really want to understand the answer to two questions. One. Yeah, so with, with tax rates, a couple of things that we learned in the last CFAT committee that I want to kind of come back to. One is that recall in three of the four facilities we have today, we are well over permanent capacity. Horning Primary, for instance, was built for 260 kids and they're running about 490. Tarmigan Ridge built for 460, they're at 630. Cliff has permanent space for 600 and they're knocking at 800. And Kevin is about 40, 50 kids away from being full. So when you think about the numbers you just saw, there's not enough debt capacity with what we have today in assessed valuation to take care of what we have today. What we learned when we looked long term, 10 years down the road, if we say no to all of that development, Ordix assessed valuation is about 3.5, 3.7 billion in a conservative scenario. With accepting the growth, we're at or above $10 billion. So we're two, over double what Tukwila is today just from the value of residential increase. So that means a couple of different things. One, for every dollar of who's in the district now, the growth will be paying two. So what that does by accepting the growth, it drops that tax rate substantially from who would exist today to take care of some of the projects that we saw. What this tax rate is built on is a very conservative 4% increase per year. What the committee really strongly recommended, we want to under promise, over deliver, and not be too aggressive in our calculations. So everything that we share, we try to lean in, what's the most conservative projection with you? Uh, when look, you look at that uh, bond scenario we just shared, the difference between that four-year scope of a 300 or $350 million bond is very negligible, 44 cents. What we would hope is that assessed valuation grows more than 4% a year. Those of you that own a home now, you know that that grew about three to four times that over the last year alone. Uh, so when we looked at the scenarios and what the committee felt like is just really that long term, it makes more sense to accept the growth because you're getting much more value for those dollars and it drives that tax rate down for everybody that's here existing. If we stretch that next bond to 2028, then that drops that tax rate a little bit further because we're amortizing that over a larger window, longer window. If we have to compress and run four years, then you can see on a conservative scenario what that would do to the tax rate. So what we want to do is get that pulse on what that high school option phase would look like and what some of the board is going to consider is, based on your feedback, is it going to make sense to tackle two things and three things? And then what we know is that enrollment drive over time is really going to help indicate to us when is that pivot for that third elementary school or phase two of the high school based on what's really happening with growth. The trend recently is that it's not growing as fast as it used to. So that's why we hired somebody to help us dig into that a little bit more deeply to really see how that plays out, which all of those plays into tax rate and timing. So we want to go to that. So I think that's what we're asking you to consider is really what is that priority for the high school construction? Um, is it a part of phase one? And then so which of these options is, uh, makes sense to you. So as you're talking in groups, I'll point out what's really valuable, I think certainly to us, I would also assume to end this, is to really hear the why, you know, which option and then why. Is that the one that makes the most sense? I think, I think we're going to take 10 minutes then for discussion, and then after that have more of a report out to hear the why. So I'll be, I'll be timekeeper. Go. <laughs> Share the why, share some of those things that we struggled with as you made your recommendations of hey, do we do high school in phase one? And then also, what option? Um, so, our group. The thing where I think in our mind is the importance of passing the bond. And so we talked a lot about uh, what would be most uh, visible uh, deliverables for the community. So what are they going to see um, that we 
can accomplish. And so we talked, um, I think where we kind of landed, we, we were debating between option A and option C. Um, with the 300 student capacity, the CTE, and then we were kind of debating the gym wrestling versus commons kitchen. And so as much as we know that a commons kitchen might be really valuable, I think we, we kind of landed on the gym, the gym aspect of it as a phase one being so visible to the community and so needed um, you know, the nighttime use that gets there, um, we still get that 300 student capacity increase, um, but we get that, that visible aspect of that uh, new athletic space. So I think that was, that was what we talked about, was the visibility of it. See, the spokesperson has nominated himself. I'm going to hand the microphone to Oh, yeah. I was afraid he was pointing at me the way he was walking towards the house. Um, <laughs> it's fine. I mean, we're, we landed right there. I'll, I'll just add um, just some strategic thinking around that, uh, that option A. We believe that the CTE space, so one of the things that's really inadequate on this campus is the science lab space. And, this, and CTE is, most of our CTE programs are science. So um, it's a, we're hurting horribly. We have two science labs uh, that are, can fit barely 28 kids in them. So health sciences and STEM science, STEM science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, CT programming that could be, and we'll, we will have a, a, a committee that will meet in the fall to really determine that. But those are our glaring needs in both those areas that would to help our students compete in the 21st century. We really need to address those needs quickly. Um, because we're behind and, and losing capacity, losing uh, speed every day, doing amazing things with our current situation. Um, so that's why um, option A, we need to include CTE. The lunchroom uh, commons area, so remember, we, we really reflected on in 2026 when the new elementary is built, Ording Primary School, as they said earlier, could still be uh, uh, alive and well for high school, and guess what they have? They have a lunchroom and they have a uh, it's a full service kitchen over there. So there's capacity for during phase two if the community voted yes on phase two of the bond to not have a fund four or five years, but at least administratively that would be a nightmare, but we can figure that out and live with that for a few years. Um, and then last but not least, the gym. The gym space and the, uh, the wrestling gym being torn down, the new gym space. And I'm going to add in there, I think we saw on that initial slide with the elementary space in North here, um, the idea of field space. And, and I would just highlight that if phase one could have turf field space, I think that combined with the gym um, is a boon to the community beyond the school day and just for students. Um, and will increase capacity for the community to say yes to the bond. Thank you very much. Explaining the why so thoroughly, and I'm coming to my last group. I need a raised hand. Who's going to sum it all up? Of the community as schools, 
So it's, it's not only to vote yes, they're voting yes because they see that they need it and it's for the, the same children, whether it's privately with a select team or if it's with the town, or if it, it's still our community. And I think that's why there's so much power in the gym um, idea, is because we do need that large space. As a gymnasium, the, the adequacy of the gym right now, we have student athletes that, that stay till 9.30 at night to practice. And it just, you, we basically have to ask our teachers to back off in winter because kids aren't getting home till 9, 10 o'clock and somewhere in there is eating and families are having to spend money because they can't manage a working lifestyle. So they have to get McDonald's money, that's where kids are eating so that they go to practice from 6 to 9. Um, so that and classrooms. Right now we're running a year-long health class because we have three simultaneous PE classes. So a gymnasium, a weight room, which we're pushing up with 30 kids in there. So we have a gymnasium, a weight room, and I send kids into a portable classroom to teach health and just spread that out so we can bounce around. Um, and then we start adding in one of the inclusive and we added some of our, uh, our most significant disabled students into the PE space. We actually really created that little tiny yoga room which we've now turned into a classroom. So there is a lot of academic effects of the gym space. Not to mention, we're about to have our first post-COVID assembly, I think, with some mitigation strategies. Um, in the gym, I think we're going to have to be sitting on the floor. I don't, I don't think Oregon High School can fit in the gymnasium any longer. So there is a lot to the gym beyond just, I think people like sports a little, yes, which you know, I've said I don't know before, but that is a major point for our entire community and for the academics of, of the community. for kids that our own kids and our schools today will benefit from and kids in the future that we don't even know who they are will benefit 40, 50 years from now. That's kind of the what we would at least like when we build something. We want to get some value out of that. So just like Ording Primary, somebody invested in those children back in the 40s and 50s 
we're doing the same for a foundation of students that allow them to be uh, into 50 years into the future beyond. So uh, what I hope you're getting a sense uh, from the board's perspective is that value around voice, around transparency, around really looking at the problem practice and authentically leaning into that. And I hope you get a little bit of a bug of excitement about what can be because we have some real challenges today and we have more ahead of us. And what we really haven't been able to do is get out in front of that proactively as a school system. But we know we can't do that on our own. That has to come with partnership with our community and our stakeholders. So what we would see is probably one more meeting before school gets out. So we're going to have a very deep conversation with our board of directors next Thursday. Your feedback is critical to helping inform that process. We'll probably have one more CFAC committee meeting uh, before school gets out. The architects will take that feedback and work on design and schematics over the summer. And then we'll have more conversations and reconvening a CPAC process in the fall to see if we're ready to really make a push next school year for a bond package. We would be probably looking at February 2023. We know any year that we delay just compounds the problem practice. Again, we're over capacity in three or four schools, and the fourth is almost there. He's a couple classes away. I want to say thank you for coming, taking away time from your, your friends, your families to be here tonight and help us to think through. And I look forward to another update uh, in a month to a month and a half before school gets up. Any questions for anybody that we can answer before we say good night? Nobody wants to be that person. Come see. If you got a question, come up. We'll be happy to answer on the side. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful night.